Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We will just give it a couple of minutes just to make sure everyone is logged in. Okay, I'll make it 1830. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Southern Joint Branch of RENA and the MRS talk on delivering world-class capabilities to the Royal Navy. Uh, tonight's talk is given by Commodore Steve Roberts, who is Deputy Director of Ships Acquisition. And tonight we'll be looking at the new builds of Type 26 and Type 31, uh, being built by BAE and Babcock, respectively. Uh, we will be using a question and answer session down on the bottom of the Zoom is a question and answer box. Uh, we would ask you to pose all your questions in there. And after the talk, Lizzie, our technical secretary, will then field the questions to Commodore Steve. Also to inform everybody that this talk is being videoed and recorded such that um, we can then upload that to the website at the end and it can be viewed then in your own time further on. If also, just, let's just remind me, you can raise your hand if they want to ask questions, but the questions will be answered at the end of the talk. Um, there's nothing more from me. Uh, over to uh, Commodore Steve. Commodore Steve, thank you. Uh, well, good evening and welcome. And thank you for inviting me to speak to you this evening uh, about what is effectively my job in Navy Command, which is delivering new ships to the Royal Navy. I'm just going to share my screen, which we did check earlier on. So that should come through. There's me with a bit more hair than, than I've currently got at the moment. So maybe that's an indication of, uh, of how well the job's going. But I have got a fantastic job. Uh, I'm responsible for delivering not just the Type 26 frigates at the senior responsible owner, but also my team are responsible for delivering into service the Type 31 frigate, the fleet solid support ship. And uh, we're eagerly awaiting uh, all the other new type of ships that are coming through as part of the pipeline uh, following the integrated review and the defence command paper. So um, what I'm going to do uh, this evening is cover effectively, I'll just go through who I am and how did I get to this position uh, and being responsible for this particular role. But I'm going to give you more of a strategic view, um, as you probably would expect, and then go some of, through some of the programmatics. And I've got 20 slides. They're, they're all pictures. You might be uh, relieved to know. Uh, so I'll take you through those slides, looking at some of the strategic context uh, behind my job, uh, covering the political interest in prosperity and the importance of how the Royal Navy is now contributing to both the defence of the nation and also our, our global prosperity. Uh, and then I'll go through some of the programmatics that are involved with delivering not just the equipment, but the capability. So uh, looking forward to the questions. The presentation, because I've done Zoom presentations before, what I'm trying to do is generate the conversation at the end of uh, these few slides. And I'm really looking forward to that um, and looking forward to your, your questions. So just a little bit about me before uh, we get into the next presentation. Um, the next set of slides. Now you can see I've had far too much fun with, uh, with this slide. Um, I started off thinking rather than just doing the traditional bio, I'll see if I've got any old shipmates out there who, who may recognize some of these ships or some of these organizations. Uh, but I, I'm gonna go through it anyway. I, I, I joined the Navy. If you go through to the top left of your picture, uh, in 1985 as a Dartmouth officer, and there's a picture of Dartmouth there. And if we go from left to right, I did my fleet time in HMS Invincible, really lucky to serve in that ship and have a, a deployment across to the West Indies, followed by another couple of stints in HMS Guernsey uh, as part of the Fishery Protection Squadron, and then HMS Middleton. 
before then joining the Royal Engineering College at Manadon. Hopefully there's a few of you cheering out there uh, for to conduct the engineering degree and then completing fleet time in HMS Ariadne, which uh, I always tell everybody when everybody talks about the fact that we're entering a digital age, uh, Ariadne was in fact the last uh, manual frigate uh, that we had in the Navy. Ever since then, we've had digital ships. So uh, the, the digital age for the Navy has been around for a while. Um, after Ariadne, conducted uh, my weapon engineering training uh, in HMS Collingwood before joining my first complement ship, HMS Gloucester. Uh, fine ship she was, joined her just after the Gulf um, conflict and uh, had a very good two years on board her before then joining what was then uh, Navy Support Command, but I couldn't find a picture of Navy Support Command, so I've tagged it as DNS, as the ADOR's desk officer. So you can see a theme developing here in terms of really showing my inner geek of looking after command management systems for the first stage of that part of my career before going to study for a master's degree at Shrivenham uh, in scientific and application software and then going back to the combat system world, looking after the Type 23 command management system before joining HMS Sutherland as the weapon engineering officer and having a fantastic deployment, uh, global deployment around the world in NTG 2000, uh, before then joining uh, as the then appointer, uh, lots of boos now from ex-service uh, ex people, no doubt, uh, from working in, uh, in, in the dockyard, uh, doing what is now known as career management, uh, and then moving on to staff course, spending some time at DSDL, uh, doing special projects before moving on to the fleet as a SWEO to Comporflot, spending some time in naval staff, working for First Sea Lord during the 2010 defense review, uh, and then, and this is the, the relevant bit to where I've got to now, spending a, a three years in DNS doing another combat system management job, uh, looking after the combat management systems for the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, and then swapping into the same role, broadening out into the combat system design authority role on promotion, and then following that becoming staff, chief staff officer engineering at NCHQ, and landing up where I am now as uh, director, deputy director, ships acquisition. So why have I covered that? I think um, what you'll show there is not just our diversity of employment, but how it's really helped in this particular role, understanding all the different aspects of the role that I'm in at the moment to deliver these ships as capabilities. And we'll come back to that throughout the rest of, of the presentation. Anyway, that is enough about me. Let's go on to some more context. Starting with the National Shipbuilding Strategy. Um, this is really the foundation of what my job evolved into and where the current Navy is completing the journey that was started by uh, Sir John Parker's report and then wrapped into the National Shipbuilding Strategy. The lessons of the time and the shipbuilding strategy was produced in 2017 was it was recognised that as an organisation the MOD was just spending too long discussing what type of ships it needed in the future and what this was affecting we were ending up having to run on the Type 23 frigates for way past their design life as we procrastinated uh, as a department about what type of ships we should build in the future. And the National Shipbuilding Strategy was really that kickstart that the department needed to really focus on the importance of having a through life plan, a regular drumbeat for shipbuilding, so that we can tie together the Navy's requirement to deliver world-class warships and defence's requirements for a growing requirement for maritime security 
and the need to provide that from a growing industrial base for ensuring that we can not only deliver the prosperity that that delivers, but the national requirement to grow the shipbuilding base in order to provide sustainable employment. One of the things that we lear we've learnt a number of times in the history of building ships is having a break in continuous shipbuilding increases your risk of being able to build ships as well as the cost associated with that. So one of the key themes of the National Shipbuilding Strategy is to ensure we continue that drumbeat and don't make the mistake of having a break in shipbuilding. And the key thing drawing out from this for me in my role is it gave us the hook for delivering the Type 26. In fact, when the report was written, the, type, the first batch one of the Type 26 had already cut steel. And I will come on to that more in, on, on a later slide. But it really gave the direction to accelerate the build of the ships through the approach taken with the then named Type 31E. Uh, we've dropped the E now, but really breaking the way that we do business by a contracting for a ship in a, in a very different way. And I'll come on to that. And also in here, you'll see uh, the hook into the fleet solid support ship. So a really good foundation for both shipbuilding and the Navy. And as part of the refresh of the following the integrated review and the defense command paper, uh, this national shipbuilding strategy is going through a refresh, uh, as I speak, hoping to be published uh, relatively soon. So for me, this is really important context because it gives me a clear direction about where ship acquisition is headed. And it gives me the confidence that it's being invested in in the future. I'll just jump to the ships. Um, some of you may be very familiar with uh, the ships, but I'll just give you a, a context from my point of view. So Type 26, for me, is a very traditional procurement. It's a ship that is required to provide anti-submarine warfare protection for our continuous at sea nuclear deterrent and the carrier strike group. And I, I would compare this to buying a Formula One car where you come with a set of requirements as a customer. I'd say, right, I need to deliver battle winning war fighting edge in the North Atlantic and to protect the carrier strike group. Here's my requirements. Now go and build the ship. And we go through the process of building a ship to make sure that we win. And that's the purpose of uh, the Type 26. Whole range of weapon systems and sensors, but her main purpose, I'll point out, is that low hull noise signature. So she's completely designed with anti-submarine warfare in mind, with the sonar sensors, the ability to defend, and the ability to prosecute through embarking organic weapons via rotary wing. But also there's a nod to the future. Uh, there has been a requirement for a flexible mission bay, recognising that in the future we will be using a lot more remotely piloted vehicles to conduct our operations over the life of this particular class. So in terms of this presentation, the challenge here is we have to be able to deliver that supremacy in the North Atlantic and protect the carrier, and this is the ship that's going to do it for us. One of the reassuring things that we've got the design right is we've successfully exported the design to Australia as part of their Hunter frigate class and Canada as the Canadian surface combatant. And I can't think of a better endorsement of RN and industries working together to produce the design when you win those competitions through open competition and other partner nations decide that that is the ship that they need to meet their national interests as well. So that's type 26. Type 31, a different challenge here. Um, 
a different approach to procurement. Rather than saying, here is a task that we definitely need you to deliver, here's the requirements, now go and design me a ship. This was a different approach, recognizing that we needed to build some ships at pace to take over from the Type 23s. Uh, and to do that, we had to do it within a constrained budget because we needed to invest into the Type 26. And I think as most people would recognize, every military capability, every military endeavor always has an economic aspect to, to actually achieving the end goal. So this, uh, my analogy here is, um, okay, so you've gone out, you've, you've bought your Formula One car, you've now got a chunk of change left over, uh, and, and now you need to go shopping on the open market to see what's out there, what's on the showroom. And the approach that was taken with 31 was setting effectively a very high level set of requirements, but running a competition to say, well, what can we get for our money? And I think as a result, we've got a very good ship, a very good design. It's one that has been proven with the Danish Navy and will be excellent at doing its job of maritime security around the world. Um, so very different approach to the procurement. Uh, and we're on contract now with Babcock to deliver type, uh, five Type 31s. Final one I mention, uh, very much in uh, the early stages at the moment, uh, the Flint Solid Support Ship. Uh, we are going through a phase of uh, requirements definition, and um, I can't really say much about the Fleet Solid Support Ship uh, because uh, we are um, in the process of just working out how to do the commercial announcement, and I wouldn't want to uh, step on uh, certainly my boss's toes about how that's going to be announced. But the bottom line here is, is that to deliver the requirements that the Navy need to support the carrier strike group, it's important that we have a logistics tail and a logistics support within the task group to deliver that. And that's exactly what the fleet solid support ship will do. Um, the carrier strike group deploying at the end of this month with RFA Fort Victoria uh, will be deploying in the future with the fleet solid support ship. So those are some context about the ships. Just to bring us up to date then, so very exciting um, integrated review, really good news for the maritime, really good news for defence. Uh, for defence, it's uh, been advertised as the Defence Command Plan, really good news for me as the Type 26 Programme Director because it gave me a clear indication that uh, defence needed eight type 26s uh, to be built and I'm um, going through the process at the moment of getting the approvals for those additional eight ships but that gives me a really clear headmark requirement, endorses the 31, endorses the fleet solid support and gives us quite uh, a um, ambitious program of future ships as well. Uh, Multi-role ocean surveillance ship and type 32s all in the concept phase at the moment and for those familiar with the CADMID phase that we use in defence, uh, looking forward to those coming into my portfolio at the right time and I'll explain how that works in some, some later slides but really important for us. But even more exciting for uh, the Navy, there is a whole section on shipbuilding. Uh, it's been recognised that shipbuilding is not only important for delivering world-class capabilities to the Royal Navy, but it's really important for national prosperity and supporting Global Britain as well. So very exciting for us. It's nice to be in the spotlight. It uh, brings its challenges as well as some reassurance as well, as you can probably imagine. I'm gonna just switch to some programmatics now. So we've got this de great demand signal. We've got, uh, a uh, really clear uh, intent from government to crack on with shipbuilding. How are we actually doing that? The way that we have formed ourselves up uh, in uh, what many of you will know as a post Levine model is the Royal Navy is actually empowered with the money to deliver its programs. And so one of the reasons you now have people like me delivering 
the programmatics and the capability is because the Royal Navy and First Sea Lord has a delegated budget to deliver the capability. That's really powerful and, uh, and enables me to have some really good conversations with my DNS delivery agent who are empowered to deliver one of the important lines of a development, which is the equipment line of development and building that relationship up with the shipbuilder, BA Systems for the Type 26, Babcock for the 31. This is a really powerful triangle and uh, it allows some really good conversations to occur as we go through uh, the always challenging process of not just building the ship, but then deliver them as a capability. So in terms of a governance level, we are really close as a customer a delivery agent and the shipbuilding primes who have of course then have the responsibility for reaching out into the supply chain to deliver the capabilities and i think that's a really powerful relationship to understand from a programmatic perspective that the the linkage is involved not just at a equipment level but also at a capability level and we'll come on to that on some other slides I'm going to talk through um, what we call in defence, defence lines of development. So how do I knit all these different types of artefacts together to deliver a capability? And actually, the starting place for me is always doctrine. Always a bit maligned, but really important. Only maligned if it is neglected and becomes dogma, but actually doctrine for me is the foundation for being able to deliver the ship and ships that the nation and the navy need. So we've got two slides here. One is taken from the current defence command paper, which gives us a really sh clear shift from previously thinking about uh, delivering military power in terms of what are you going to use for war fighting and then how do you use it in peacetime. It really recognises that there is a grey zone between peacetime and full on war scale fighting and actually engaging in that middle zone, whether it's for cyber or whether it's using maritime power to project influence around the globe with every ship, a station, an opportunity to project a, a British global influence around the world is really important. And that is fundamental to how UK maritime power then gets delivered using the three tenets of war fighting, maritime security and defence diplomacy or international engagement. So understanding how our maritime capabilities fit into the wider defence requirement and is really important as we develop um, and uh, deliver our ships. So doctrine really underpins and feeds what many of you will, will recognise as a classic curve for delivering big programs. Um, and I'll go through this in, in, in two ways to so go back to the, the 26 example, which would be a traditional V curve where you've defined what you need to do, the concept of operations, you need to defend the carrier uh, strike group and you need to defend the continuous at sea deterrent. So you set out your concept of operations. From that you come up with some requirements. Then you have to do some cost analysis. Uh, to make sure that you're affordable. Then you do the, de the detailed design. And that's where we are at the moment in terms of finishing off the detailed design, building the ship. And now we're coming out doing the integration and we'll get into the system verification and validation and then the operation and maintenance uh, at the latter end of the 2020s. So then looking at the 31 example, um, concept of operations, very much maritime security. So rather than the Navy really pinning down all the different requirements. When we went to the competition, it was a case of, well, which one of these offerings really meets the requirements? And so it's a different way of thinking about how we've procured ships. It's about saying, well, this one is the best fit. Once we've accepted that, it's we're going to build the ship in accordance with how the competition is delivered. It presents its, uh, its own challenges, but it does allow us to deliver the broad concept of operations of maritime security at pace and within a much affordable envelope. 
So that's um, that's the doctrine side. The equipment side. Um, normally, uh, the area that gets the most attention and the slides here uh, a great example. So the big one is Type 26 on the hard stand and govern. Uh, the team there are just in the process of joining the forward section with the aft section. Uh, and the, the other two slides I really point out to say that everybody focuses on steel and uh, everybody. There, there's a, there is a common focus on steel cutting and building the ship, but of course, there's a lot more to it, as I hinted at the earlier slide about the supply chain. So you've got a picture there of a motor being fitted. There is a lot of activity across the supply chain where actually most of the investment happens uh, across, um, across the ELOD and the equipment line development. And the other picture above there is the integration centre at Portsdown. So that happens to be the combat system integration centre. But of course, there's also uh, marine, inter, uh, marine system integration centres for different ships as well. So recognising that to deliver your equipment, you have to just not build the shell. It's about delivering the, the equipment, the systems and the integration. Re really important, uh, but just as important. And this is just as fascinating for me is when you are delivering a capability is how you deal with the training. And, and this normally presents opportunities to really have a think about how we deliver training, both for marine engineers, weapon engineers, operators, and potentially breaking the mould using new techniques, using digital techniques, but not forgetting that when you're on board a ship, the haptic skills, the ability to actually touch and feel and do maintenance is really important. I think we've been on a journey here where the Chief Naval Engineering Officer is really clear with his strategy. It's important that our maintainers and our technicians at sea are able to both operate their equipment, maintain it, but also do the diagnostics and repair. So having a new capability is a great opportunity to refresh how we are delivering our training, not just for the ships, but also some of the career courses as well. So a really important activity um, to focus on as we're delivering a capability. And we work very closely with the schools in uh, Collingwood and Sultan and the FOSS training teams to ensure that the courses are available, they're designed, they go through a training needs analysis, ready to bring the ships on, ready so that we have the training available to bring the ships online. Another key one for us um, in terms of defence is the infrastructure. So bringing, so Type 26, for example, being brought into Devonport Dockyard, uh, doing all those checks. So will she fit? Uh, will, we do any, will we need to do any dredging? Will we need to do any environmental impacts? Uh, I mentioned mission modules earlier on. Will we need to provide mission module mounting facilities alongside dockyard facilities? Will the warehousing be, be correct? Will there be enough office space to deliver the fleet time support maintenance period? Um, lots of work going on down in Devonport at the moment to in, enable the Type 26 to be supported there, just in the same way that the work happened uh, in Portsmouth for the QEC class to, to be hosted. So uh, another a uh, big line of activity there and then integrating that with the schedule for the Type 26 so that the uh, infrastructure is ready at the same time as the training uh, is another key, key aspect and I'll come on to how we do that in a later slide. Logistics, uh, really important and of course in terms of how we define logistics in our doctrine that also includes the engineering support. So actually one of the most exciting areas to get involved in because it actually takes up more of my time working out how I'm going to uh, get approval for and then enact the support contracts for the ships rather than just building them. So supporting the whole range of uh, power propulsion and combat systems and then providing that uh, through life support and logistics framework to actually have the right spares, the right maintenance, the right tech docks ready to go on the shelves to support these ships at reach is 
probably a bigger challenge for me than it is actually building the ships. Uh, a very exciting challenge as well, uh, something that uh, requires an awful lot of investment so that we can actually deliver the right support to uh, the, the maintainers and the operators at sea. And people, we talked about bringing the infrastructure together, talked about bringing the training together, but actually bringing a new class of ship in also gives you an opportunity to work out what type of career our people will have. Uh, the branch development uh, for Type 26 and 31 allows, gives us opportunities to review what are those traditional boundaries. Our branches need to evolve. Um, for those who have served, uh, you will have seen the branches evolve. They will evolve again in Type 26. They will evolve again in Type 31. They will evolve again in our future ships as we bring in more um, remotely piloted vehicles as well. So not only having the people ready to go, having them ready to be trained, but understanding uh, on, in our citizen Navy how to motivate people so they're excited about coming to sea, excited about serving on our new ships, excited about the career paths we can offer, or, uh, as, as well as everything else. Just as important to me to deliver this capability. So we work very closely with the branch managers to ensure that we're putting the right structure in the, uh, the future ships to enable us to deliver a sustainable career structure for our people. So last few slides, this, this knits together. So I've come onto the organization of defense line of development first in, in that proper way we do form should follow function. And the team that works for me is split into three areas as you would expect, uh, followed up with um, a set of requirements managers so we can both set the requirements and then track how they're delivered. But you'll see the cloud that's underneath there. We've got a matrix managed system with uh, schedulers whose responsibility is to knit together all those defense lines of development into a schedule that can deliver a ship all the way through to me delivering a ship that's fully operating to fleet commander. We've got risk managers. Risk is the currency that we use in all our uh, programs to ensure that we are um, mitigating any uh, and mitigating with either money or processes or activity to deliver these complex programs. I have of course got finance business partners. I've got a comms team and I need a comms team to answer parliamentary questions uh, to ensure that all the um, questions that will come to us both from an external source and internal source are properly coordinated and answered and when you have uh, the spotlight on us as you do as we do at the moment with these programs it's really important to have a comms team that uh, can keep everything coordinated. Um, I've got two other ones I've got something new that we've really built on following QEC is a transition into service and a set of safety managers that looks at how we are going to operate these ships and develop the evidence to not only satisfy ourselves we can operate the ships but satisfy the regulators are. I think too often in the past uh, we have relied on our equipment delivery teams to say there you go here's the equipment it's safe to operate. What we haven't done as well in the past is worked out well how are we going to operate it safely where's the operating instructions who's going to develop them. That's not really the remit of a shipbuilder, navies do that best. And so we have a team to actually get involved and develop the standard operating procedures and help us transition into service. And then uh, a new one for me is we've got an exports team. So having exported Type 26 to Canada and Australia, that brings a whole bunch of opportunities for us to exploit. Uh, both in sharing information about how we operate our ships, but also attacking the supply chain to drive value for money out of the supply chain, bringing three nation uh, buying power to drive economies of scale. And also, actually, what I found, there's an awful lot of uh, process involved in just transferring information from one nation to another. Uh, by the time you have to go through security protocols, export controls, and intellectual property protocols, I need a team to do that information transfer. I'll, I'll pick two examples. 
um, about why I need safety managers. This is a great diagram about how uh, the process we need to to go through to deliver a ship air interface with uh, a number of stakeholders from the ship platform authorities, the ship duty holders, the airframe duty holders, the airframe technical authorities having to come together to work out how we build a ship that is safe to aviate from and then getting the aviators on board so that they feel comfortable about aviating from the ship. And that bunch of evidence, as you can imagine, takes a while to compile. So uh, this gives you an example about why I need those, uh, those safety managers and that transition to, to service team. And uh, the fun bit of the job, of course, working in exports is you do get to travel. Uh, before COVID, managed to get a go to cross to Australia, build those networks, build that connections. Uh, this is the Australian and Canadian team uh, at our last global combat ship user group meeting and uh, that was hosted in Can uh, in Canberra and Adelaide. And the Australians have got a great shipbuilding yard in Adelaide um, and this is the team with my DNS colleagues uh, doing exactly what I just said earlier on, sharing information uh, and allowing us to drive some value for money into the supply chain and then looking ahead how we get common benefits from sustainability opportunities. Which brings me to, to the last slide. So I know I've skipped over quite a lot there, but hopefully I've done enough to uh, stimulate some questions. Uh, I've talked about the strategic context, uh, the national shipbuilding strategy, the latest integrator review and defense command paper uh, that might generate some questions. I've talked about the three ships, uh, where we've got to, the three ships that are currently within my portfolio Looking forward to some more ships coming to my portfolio when the concept phase completes and how we actually deliver those ships from a cross defence lines of operation capability perspective. So um, I'll pause there and hand over back to Lizzie, I think, who uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Commodore Steve, for a very interesting uh, lecture there. Um, certainly some new things to me. Um, we have a few questions that have been asked in the Q&A. Uh, some of them are kind of on the same topic, so I thought I might group them together. So we've had three different questions on the Type 32. <laughs> 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 you know about that. Um, so, so I guess I'll, I'll ask all three together and then you can kind of see if you can come with an answer. So the first one was, could you just tell us more about the Type 32? Then the next question was, uh, since the Type 32 came as a surprise to most people in the Royal Navy when it was announced by the Prime Minister, how mature was the concept when this was done and can you shed any light on what the Type 32 is? And then the last one is about, given the different procurement approaches for Type 26 and Type 31, what lessons have we learned so far that might be valuable for future acquisitions, including the Type 32? Yeah, uh, really, really. Um, and forgive me if I can't share all the details with the 32 purely because uh, we, we have yet to go into that commercial phase. Uh, but um, you'll forgive me if I just have to repeat what's in the defence uh, command paper in that we're looking for the 32 to do maritime security operations. We're looking for it to be the type of ship that is going to be really exploiting future technology. So looking at modular capabilities in a much bigger way, uh, looking at how uh, we can, um, can mitigate the threat. So big theme of the defense command paper was being threat led and then working out what capabilities we need to deliver against those. And really looking to exploit the modular capabilities that will be trailblazed in 26 and using the um, mine countermeasures concept that's being delivered at the moment uh, to really explore how autonomy can help us counter the threat. Uh, autonomy comes with its own challenges. Uh, it comes with the additional burden of additional technical resource. So ve very much looking to see how those current programs go. So for those that are familiar with the, the way we procure um, equipment, we go through a CADMID phase, a concept assessment demonstration manufacturer. And I've always been constantly told in my early stages of the career, don't solutioneer at the beginning, leave it to the experts 
to really work out what the actual uh, end product would look like. And, and that's why I think it's uh, frustrating for some that we didn't announce, here's 32 and here what it looks like, and this is what it's gonna be fitted with, and these are the people that are gonna be involved in. I think that would be the wrong approach at the moment. We have to go through the proper, this is what we need to do, this is the threat, this is the concept, and then work that through. Uh, and it's gonna be frustrating at the moment because we won't have, here they go, here's the picture and here's what it looks like. But it's reassuring that the government has committed to the next phase and we will be getting, and I know that the teams are getting after the Type 32 concept at pace at the moment. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, um, why are we insisting on building ships with steel? I know that the Navy currently has a problem with corrosion. Would we not be better building a fleet of smaller ships such as the Visby class, since a smaller ship with a smaller crew complement supported by AVs means a bigger and more sustainable fleet? Well, I, I think that question just ties in really nicely to what I've just said about 32s. I mean, we, we are where we are with type 26s uh, and 31s, but why not? What, I mean, the 32 could be exactly that. Um, I wouldn't want to speculate where it's going to go, but we should be open to those ideas. It, it could be, uh, as long as we're delivering uh, what the nation needs, as long as we're delivering the right warfighting, uh, maritime security and international engagement capability to the Royal Navy, we shouldn't dismiss these ideas. And I'm definitely up for that type of approach. Okay, the next question is, with respect to Type 26 and the design requirements for North Atlantic operations, is there a danger of this class subsequently being deployed to different environments where it has a degraded performance, for example, the Persian Gulf? Really good question. Um, I wouldn't say it's a danger. I would say it's an inevitability, um, in my personal opinion. I don't think, you look at the Type 23, which was originally envisioned to do exactly this, um, to operate as a tow de ray tug in the North Atlantic. It is exactly the reason why um, we've learned those lessons in the 26, uh, which is why we have a modular a mission module bay. Uh, over the life of these ships, the threat will change. The, the design of the 26 allows us to flex the capability using those mission modules by um, enabling a different range of capabilities to be fitted to, to flex across all those entire different roles. It's why uh, the requirement includes a, uh, a medium, range, medium range gun. It's why we've got uh, the, the ability to host uh, a Chinook size airframe on the, uh, the flight deck. And it's why we've got complete configure in the mission modules, not just in the mission modules, but I think your questioner was actually spot on, but also in all the services uh, from having an open architecture to integrate future mission modules and mission systems uh, to having all the relevant um, hotel services so that we can deploy globally. This is the requirement for the Type 26 was not only to be able to operate as part of a carrier strike group and protect CASD, but also to operate independently around the globe. So absolutely really recognise that question. And I fully expect that throughout the life of these ships, they will be seen everywhere around the globe. Okay, uh, the next question is, with Type 31 being more of a built print approach, how does this affect the generation of appropriate training? Uh, again, again, that's a really good question. I think um, in breaking the mould of procurement, you have to take a risk that what is selected to meet your requirements is going to have some differences in what we're going to buy. And there's pros and cons to that. So for example, we have now uh, bought into a Thales Tacticos uh, command management system, which will require the support solution to adapt to ensure that the training solution provides a training solution for that particular uh, system. We've got, we have for the 31, effectively employed some, some, some new gunnery systems and new radar systems. Now, the benefit of that is uh, going through competition. We have driven down costs and presented future opportunities for Navy to exploit in where it might want to take uh, its gunnery uh, or its command management system enterprise. There is a payoff, as I think your questionnaire would recognise, is that if you 
introduce divergence when it comes to support you introducing more challenges into the support environment there, there's always a balance if you go to a process where you've only got a single supplier the ability to incentivize that supplier becomes quite tricky we have single source regulations uh, to have an open book relationship with those types of suppliers and it certainly has economies of scale when you have convergence but brings another challenge of ensuring you've got that incentivization running and so 31 has broken the mold it's given us a challenge uh, we are where we are with 31 that's where we need to crack on with uh, the the interesting thing about the latest issue of um, the defense security uh, industrial strategy is it just tips a nod to maybe going complete competition isn't where we want to do to go we may want to have a more strategic relationship with some of our suppliers which just gives us a hook to maybe take some more direction in where future procurements go to potentially be more directive um, it's going to be interesting to see how that translates into a refreshed national shipbuilding strategy i know the teams in mod center are working on that but i think the core question of divergence through competition or convergence through direction is going to be a live issue that's going to be without with us throughout shipbuilding throughout the ages okay uh the next question is do you believe that there are any further export prospects for the type 26 and type 31 definitely uh definitely uh it's it's we, we've had interest uh i think it would be wrong to uh, share those confidences at the moment um to be honest i think uh, a lot of people in the uk were quite surprised that the ship that wasn't built for exports has been so successful um, in exporting to australia and canada which shows the confidence in the design it shows the quality of uh, uk engineering especially in generating a quiet ship um, we have we have other interest in type 26 there is a lot of interest in 31 i think the big challenge for us is actually going to be making sure that the uh, industrial base can cope with potentially the demand. The, um, the, the thing about exporting ships is a lot of nations would like to build them on shore. That is not necessarily a bad thing because as I've shown, a lot of the resource and a lot of the work happens in the supply chain with the supply of equipment and the integration. So it's not just about where the ships are built. If we export the 31 design, as we've done with the 26 design, there still presents an awful lot of opportunities for UK industry. So there's a, there, there is a lot of interest in, in the designs that um, have been chosen. So I, I think it's, it's a case of watch this space in terms of exports. Okay, uh, the next question is, do you see the Royal Navy adopting different manning models that might become more similar to the Merchant Navy for these new classes of ship? Uh, not for 26 um, or 31, but maybe for future ships and maybe in the future. So um, for, for Type 26, the equipment that we're fitting on there, the combat system is effectively a lift and shift of the Type 23. The power propulsion systems are relatively the same. For Type 31, we've gone to the open markets, we bought a, day, a traditional design, goes back to there, you know, it's, it was something that was on the open market. Now we have to evolve branch structures and we have to provide a better offer to our citizen sailors in order for them to uh, want to join the Navy in the first place and, and then uh, stay in it. So we have to offer different models. The, the dual crewing model that we're adopting in the Gulf at the moment in HMS Montrose is exactly an attempt to provide stability to our sailors. And if we don't keep innovating in the way we do our branch structures, uh, then we'll stagnate and we won't give that exciting offer to our future sailors. It's, it's going to be one that's going to evolve. Um, and certainly in 20 years time, we won't have the same branch structures that we have now. The journey from now to 20 years time is going to be interesting. Uh, and I think how the 32 concept evolves and how autonomy evolves will be probably the pacing function about how our branch structures evolve. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question is, will there be an MCM capability module on the Type 26? There can be. Um, I've had no approaches yet. Uh, the, 
the system's there, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we do have one. Um, it goes back to the other uh, question. I mean, sh the ships are built and designed for that high-end war fighting as we in the North Atlantic. But if they do go and deploy to the Gulf as part of that single, there is absolutely no reason why uh, any sort of mission module, including mine hunting capabilities, could be deployed with them. That is exactly why the capability is being put in there. And um, one of the one of the more uh, interesting evolutions um, that can be conducted on this ship is that the crane that we are fitting to the mission module will allow containers to be picked up from the dockside using the ship's own crane. So it provides that flexibility as well, not only to provide potential mine countermeasures modules, but humanitarian aid, uh, special forces boats. It's a complete flexible system. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future uh, at some point a Type 26 does deploy with a mission module which has a mine hunting capability. Um, I suspect in the in the near years it will be doing its primary role of uh, the, in the North Atlantic. Okay, um, how do you see the role of the River Class Batch 2 developing in the future, considering that they're now being deployed further afield than originally expected, and noting that they could be readily upgraded towards being more of a conventional corvette? I think that comes to choices. Um, they have proven to be really versatile. Uh, they have shown their ability to conduct maritime security uh, patrols really well in the Caribbean, in the Mediterranean. The, their utility has been recognised in the integrated review and in the defence command paper. Um, there are, as people have put, spotted, opportunities to upgrade them. Uh, the, the stage we're at the moment, uh, we've, we've got such a fill up from the um, integrated review and, and command paper. There is so much ambition opportunities in there. It's working out where we need to invest those for the, the best investment. Uh, and so with those ships, as most ships over their life, uh, there's an opportunity there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they are fitted with additional equipment. Um, we may want to bring in other uh, capabilities first, uh, but I think it is an exciting opportunity. Okay, um, from the Royal Navy perspective, what are the primary perceived challenges to the technical delivery of these large scale projects? Oh, um, first of class, new technology integration. So how you, first of all, do your cost forecasting for, for delivering what is effectively a prototype um, and then ensuring that you have allocated the uh, right risk provisions, both in uh, ensuring you've got the right team, you've got the right integration facilities, you de-risk shore side as much as you can, uh, you uh, ensure that the design is properly accredited, and then you allow yourself to learn the lessons from the first time of integration and then embed those in and then ensure that you um, in, make any mistakes once and then embed those into the future so that uh, you can actually ensure that the future ships that come along can learn from the first ship. Uh, nobody's going to pretend that when you build a ship of the first of class for the first time, you're not learning lessons all the time. And for me, it is the integration of those component parts, especially power and propulsion parts and in the shaft line, where you can de-risk in our, on a digital model, you can de-risk in shore integration facilities, but you need high quality people uh, ready to be flexible enough to take a plan and ad adapt and adjust it as you do the, the first of class acceptance and then embed that in learning for the future classes. So I think that's what makes the job so exciting. And it's not just in the equipment world, it's the same in the training world as well. We have to have the same mentality there where the first training solution for a particular piece of equipment may not be the one you want. The first operating procedure for equipment may not be the right one. You have to test and adjust that. The, the first branch structure we have may not be the right one. And you may have to, so it doesn't just apply to the equipment. It applies to everything 
through the people, the training, the doctrine and the organisation you've got in place. It makes it exciting. OK, we've still got a fair few questions to go. Um, the next one is, will modularity reduce maintenance and acquisition costs? Not yet, is my personal opinion. Uh, but there's an opportunity there. So um, when we start, in my experience, you get opportunity costs when you scale up. So the research bits, the first of class bits, the seeing what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, my prediction in the future, there will always be a blend. Uh, but actually, when we found something that works really well, and we have done that in the mine hunting capability, there's an opportunity there to scale up quickly and uh, ensure that where people are best doing people tasks, we put people there, where machines and autonomy are best doing those type of tasks, then we put machines there. So I think it is really worth the investment. Uh, the efficiencies come when you scale up. Getting to the scaling up bit is the difficult step. And that's the bit that we uh, need to get at and then start delivering. Okay, um, so the next question is, what would you regard as being the most innovative features of Type 26 and why do you think it has been so successful as a global combat ship design shared with Australia and Canada? Um, most innovative bit, I have to go back to the crane. It's, uh, and I'm a weapon engineer and I think it's the crane. It's, um, it's able to geostationary position itself in three dimensions while it's moving. That is incredible. Uh, it's, it's got to be able to uh, get a safety case where it can lift a boat full of people and it's got to be able to lift containers off the jetty and bring it back in again. That mission module system uh, allows the ship to be utilised independent of any host nation infrastructure. So I'm sorry for that, it's disappointing. Maybe I should have said open architectures. Maybe I should have, should have said the uh, CSAP to missile system. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have said an awful lot of other things about this, but actually for me, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the crane. Um, what, sorry, was, there was a part two of the question as well. Um. Oh yes, um, how, why has it been so successful as a, a global combat ship? Uh, okay, I think it's been successful because the other nations have recognised the future threat is coming in the ASW sphere. And they looked around the world and they said, what Navy is good at ASW and what nation is build, good at building ships? And the whole form is what they wanted. They wanted a quiet, reliable whole form, which has been proven. And we know the Type 23 has been incredibly successful as an anti-submarine warfare platform. We've taken a technology from the submarine community. We've built on the knowledge from Type 23. I think Australian Canada said, that's what we need. The threat's underwater. We're going we're gonna to invest in that. And then they built on their own combat systems on top of it. Um, and, and that's why the competition, uh, and that's why the 26 design beat the competition. Okay, uh, moving on. How long will it be before the Royal Navy is operating unmanned ships and not just small boats? <laughs> wow. Uh, my, my honest answer is I don't know. I think all I can say that it will happen um, in, in the future. And it goes back to um, how best you want to use your people. So people are expensive and uh, we need to invest them and we need to value them. But uh, if you can use, if you can scale up by having your people using autonomous systems and then gain an advantage over the enemy by doing that type of approach, um, I think that you, you won't ever get rid of people, but you may see vessels being operated remotely by people who may still be on other vessels, but to get the economies of scale, um, that will be an exciting area to explore. It's, it's going to come, so we've got to embrace it. Um, it's, it's a sail to steam moment. It's a horse to tank moment. This technology is there. Let's move with it. Let's embrace it. The sail to steam and the tank to ho the horse to tank didn't get rid of people, it, but it did change the way that we conducted ourselves in environments. So people will always be there, but we may be having some exciting times in terms of new equipment. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, will the fleet solid ship be built in the UK? That is something I'm going to have to pass on uh, and leave that announcement to the Secretary of State for Defence. Um, 
I think, unfortunately, that one's well, well above my pay grade. Uh, I think uh, it's a good question. Uh, I don't deny that. Uh, we're expecting an announcement uh, in, in weeks few. So, uh, I, and I definitely do not want to pinch uh, my elected representatives, Secretary of State sandwiches by making any unnecessary comments on the fleet solid support ship. Okay, uh, the next question is, is fleet transformation and the reduction in NCHQ posts affecting business activities in DES? Uh, not that I've come across, and I might be lucky because I'm in a uh, area of defence which is growing, which people want to uh, expand, which government wants to invest in because they want to grow the Navy for global prosperity in global Britain. They want to invest in shipbuilding because it invests in those high end skills and they see it as a, as a, as a great way of investing both in young people and apprentices and delivering prosperity as part of a post-COVID recovery. Um, so I haven't had any problem recruiting in my area. Most of the people that work for me are actually civil servants and that provides a really good blend of experience. So in that bubble diagram that you saw, uh, I, am an, I am able to really generate a really fresh career path for people in Navy Command to do scheduling, to do risk management, to do program management, to gain the skills, to gain their APM qualifications. There is a path in Navy Command alone for somebody to join as a D grade and work the way all the way up to one star and also come and, and work with my DNS colleagues. So in fact, 26 teams, 31 teams, FSS teams, certainly um, because we are entrusted to deliver quite a significant um, responsibility as we entrusted us in the IR and Defence Command Plan. I, I haven't had a problem with uh, the way that uh, Navy transformation is going. And again, it's, it's got to be, uh, headquarters can't stay static. They have to evolve. We have to embrace new ways of working. Uh, and we have to get that balance right between having people who are paid to be at sea being sure and getting the right balance between that sure sea time and the balance of the family time and actually employing their skills at sea. Okay, uh, so the next question is quite lengthy. The UK and the US have adopted a high-low shipbuilding procurement strategy. Australia and Canada are currently planning an all-high capability approach by buying large numbers of Type 26 derivatives. Do you think they're being naive and will eventually have to adopt a similar strategy to the UK, or is the UK naive in the utility of lower end ships like the Type 31? I think it's um, horses for courses here, different um, nations, different capabilities. So uh, my Canadian colleagues with the Halifax class, a bit like the 23s, uh, they've been running them on for a long time and, and they need to replace them. And they've taken the decision that uh, it's going to be better value for money for them to buy one ship to do a range of functions. So the Canadian surface combatant uh, has quite a different com combat management system uh, and command management system. And it's got quite a range of anti-surface and anti-air systems on it as well. The Australian system, uh, very, very similar. Uh, they've taken the view that uh, they're going to buy it in, in batches and they fitted um, their own radar on it, really good radar actually, um, to, to their Australian ship. So it's less, so again, it's got an ASW pedigree as well as a really powerful uh, AAW capability. Uh, for, for both their reasons, they've, they've gone for those approaches. I, I, for the, I can speak for the UK. Um, I think the national shipbuilding strategy was clear. We spent too long deciding what 26 was going to be. Um, it forced us to go into a 26 high-end uh, type 31. Let's see what uh, we can do with the rest of the, the cash. And it's actually given us a really capable ship. And I think that uh, all credit to the, to the team that were working on the 31 uh, endeavor. Uh, we've come up with a really good way of actually uh, recovering from that uh, pause in, in shipbuilding. It's something that, um, we, we aren't going to, we have no intention of repeating, hence the commitment to 32 and the Type 83, which is also mentioned in the Defence Command paper. Okay, uh, the next question is, are there any availability targets for Type 26 and Type 31? 
And is the Royal Navy investing sufficiently in ILS to ensure downstream support will be affordable and effective? So yes, I do have availability targets. Uh, I was only uh, presenting them to Vice Chief of Defence Staff a couple of weeks ago. Um, you'll forgive me if I don't share them, but we, we do. Uh, and as I said, a lot of my time at the moment is actually spent um, doing the support and working up the support business case for Type 26. There is a real appetite to ensure that we learn lessons from where we have required to not just deliver the tech technical documentation, but all the support infrastructure that's required. And one of the opportunities I'm looking to exploit to try and get efficiencies of scale is working with Australia and Canada so that we can have the same support infrastructure. And, and that's from simple things like having a shared spares pool. So we may not have to have the same quantity of spares that each nation would, would need, having uh, from the big insurance spares to actually looking at how we invest in the supply chain for the regular um, consumable spares, having common information knowledge management systems so we can understand how our ships operate, what's likely to break, how we do condition monitoring across the class. There's a real opportunity here for having, uh, working with Canada and Australia to really um, embrace a common way of working for support. So it's a challenge. Uh, there's always a, uh, affordability challenges with any defence procurement, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's one that's recognised and there's one that can be exploited uh, through our Canadian and Australian colleagues. The Type 31, can, we, we also share equipment on 31, not just with our own um, ships, but also other areas. So, so 31, uh, again, looking at different ways of doing support. Uh, my colleague, Admiral Jim Hyam in DNS, is looking at uh, transforming how DNS can do its support with the using Type 26 and Type 31 as catalysts to um, look at how additional efficiencies and opportunities can be exploited from the ships. So as all things, you've got to innovate, you've got to evolve uh, when we're delivering new capabilities. Okay, and this, this is the final question. I won't be accepting any more because we have slightly run over. Uh, so ship acquisition must come with many challenges, with the age-old challenge of not just seeking to future-proof our assets, but ensuring that lengthy build processes don't encroach into any technological advantages you seek to gain. Shorten the build process to maximise perceived advantages. It's a really good question, and it's, um, it's a challenge that we do face because shipbuilders like a, st a stable requirement, and um, ships take years to build. Uh, if you're an IT professional, uh, if it's just an anathema to, for you to think about buying an IT system that you're not going to use for five years. It's a real challenge that we're facing at the moment in the shipbuilding world, which means that uh, for a lot of our platforms now, we are going, we're actually deliberately telling the shipbuilder, don't worry about what we're going to fit in there in terms of a, a, a weapon system or an IT system. That will come later on. Make sure that when you build the ship, it's got the space, weight and services. It's got a compartment which has got the data connections, the power connections, um, and it's got the, the ventilation that we're going to need to fit a server rack or some um, uh, any other equipment, because we won't know and it'd be wrong to define what is going to be fitted in there in the future. So it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. And I think that the way that we're doing that uh, is we're evolving into more. We will be contracting in the future, shipbuilder, build a ship, but make it um, make enough space into it that we can then come along with the latest technology and we'll fit the latest technology after we've accepted the, the ship off you as the builder and do it in, in a capability insertion period. Um, and we're, we're, we're seeing that uh, there's examples of that in Queen Elizabeth. And I think we're having, we will definitely be adopting that. I know in type 26 for some of our IT systems where I've told the shipbuilder, don't worry about what's going to be fitted in there. We'll fit it later. You just provide us the service. It's the arterial services that are important at the build stage and we'll fit stuff later on. Thank you. Um, so before we conclude the lecture, I have a, a couple of announcements for you all. So the first one is I've been asked by IMRS to, uh, well, to say the following. So if you enjoyed the lecture and have an interest in naval engineering, then why not join the IMRS Naval Engineering Special Interest Group?
This community of interest has over 600 members from 44 countries and promotes information sharing and networking. It coordinates and delivers a range of conferences, seminars, webinars, and panel discussions that you can attend live or watch on IMRS TV. It's easy to join, you just need to log on to My IMRS and search for the Naval Engineering Special Interest Group. As part of the Nexus Group, you can engage in discussions and access the latest news, and as a corresponding member, you'll be the first to hear about the latest events. Whatever your interest in naval engineering, as a seafarer, designer, student, academic, naval architect, or engineer of any discipline, you'd be most welcome. So please visit my MRS and take a look. So that's that particular task done. Uh, moving on to some joint branch, our next lecture will be on the 10th of June and will be on the topic of row row shafting dynamic measurements. It's going to be the last lecture of this um, technical lecture program. Um, after that will be on hiatus until October. So uh, I hope you can attend our last lecture. It's been an interesting year so far. Um, so uh, I'm just going to hand you all over to Nigel, who's just going to conclude the lecture. Well, well first of all, thank you all for attending. Um, I think everyone agreed that it was very, it's like this sort of talk into the procurement of uh, future vessels within the RN. And through the chat and the questions, probably a little bit more than Commodore Steve actually wanted to give away. But I think he's done very, very well. And uh, on, on our behalf, Commodore Steve, thank you very much for giving your time up to give this talk tonight. And so we've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and found out some interesting facts about my general service counterparts. And um, I'd want, like to wish everybody a very good night. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everybody. Good night.